All right, uh, like uh, like Shane said, uh, you know we've been wanting to do this for a little bit of a uh, you know some time. Uh, last year was the first time we went inter county little league. Of course, this is going into my fifth year. Last year going into my fourth, we felt like we were in a position we could finally do that. And we looked at you know all ways around doing it for the benefit of our kids. And uh, you know I got a friend that coaches out in Allen County that's done that for a, for a number of years, had a lot of success with it. And uh, you know, kind of going against the grain, but at the same time, it gives us full control over what we want to do with our little league program. And uh, you know, county like Marshall County, you got you know the numbers to do it. You look at West Kentucky; not everybody has that luxury. You know, so some things we had to do to make that happen was combine you know fifth and sixth grade, combine in third and fourth grade, and then of course what we did last year was bringing in first and second grade tackle football. All right, and I don't know if y'all pay attention in the media or anything, but uh, USA football just started that. Uh, this year, so we're you know right on page with, with some of the things that's going on. So in West Kentucky, we're the only uh, little league that offers that right now. You know, so there's a lot of things we was able to do. Uh, of course, you guys know several of you coached last year, um, and I uh, got to see that firsthand. Which we was able to have our postseason uh, tournament, had it out here uh, after fall break. Felt like that was another good good thing we had. Uh, you know, out of that, one thing we want to kind of add in this year is kind of giving a uniformed approach to our uh, to our program. Okay, uh, which my staff, Coach David Morris, he uh, coaches offense for us. He's our offensive coordinator. He's going to talk a little bit about what we're going to do offensively at the high school level and how it's going to kind of trickle down into our lower grades. Uh, coach Chase McCann back there is our middle school coach. He's going to be implementing a lot of that uh, this fall as well. And then the uh, goal is, as you guys get started with your seasons, give you guys kind of a playbook to start with, okay? And uh, Coach Tracy Cleaver is going to be talking about uh, the defensive stuff that, that we do that we would like to implement as well. And what we want to try to do as, as coaches at the, at the high school staff is give you guys resources, okay? And, and that's something that, you know, in the past, you know, we've had to, you know, travel outside the county and try to find games. Well, I know sometimes, you know, that's, that's been problematic. But what we can do now is, you know, we can play, you know, all within Marshall County on a, on a Saturday morning. You guys can coach your team throughout the week. And I feel like, you know, we can get our kids fundamentally prepared before they get into middle school and high school. Uh, last year, I was able to bring Coach Andrew Johnson on staff. He's our running backs coach. He's also a uh, Marshall County alum. Uh, one of my first years on staff as an assistant, he was a player. So it kind of shows my age a little bit. I was able to coach Chase as well. You know, so getting program guys back in the program is another thing that I think is going to help us out down the road. Well, he's going to kind of be my liaison this year. That's one of his uh, staff assignments. So on Saturdays and maybe sometimes at practice, he'll be around. Whereas, you know, you can ask questions to him. You know, if he can't answer it, we'll, we'll you know, forward that on. We'll make sure we get you the information you need. But Andrew's been involved with, with a lot of the meetings we've had going forward uh, into that. But uh, this is just a time, you know, we're, it's, you know, pretty casual. You know, we'll answer questions as we go along. But uh, you know, I'll go ahead and kind of, you know, share with you. We're going to go over our offensive overview. Coach Morse going to talk about what we're doing kind of at the high school level and how it's going to trickle down to, uh, to the lower grades. Same way with Coach Cleaver, the defense. Uh, and this is also going to serve as your um, coaching certification video. And that's why... Uh, Dale Hargrove's filming that, but you guys are able to get that done today. And that means any Little League coach that, uh, that coaches for us in the fall will have to watch this video to get certified. So we're also going to show you the, uh, the Seattle Seahawks put out a film in 2015 called Hawk Tackling. But what it is, it allows you to be heads up certified. Okay, being heads up certified allows you to coach on the field. And it's different than it was when you guys played. You know, when we all played Little League football, you know, concussions was something you heard about, but, but it's an epidemic now. I mean, that's something that we got to make sure that, that we teach tackling properly. You know, we got to make sure that our coaches are trained in how to teach tackling. You know, because heaven forbid we have an injury, a catastrophic injury, we don't that, want that liability to fall on you guys or the program. So we're going to teach you guys a little bit about some of the stuff we're doing offensively, defensively, get you uh, heads up certified tonight. And then, uh, you know, for the most part, just uh, kind of set you guys on your way. In which this time of year for us is a good time to do that. April is, a, you know, a busy time with our spring. But at the same time, it allows us to focus on some other levels. Like right now, we're also having our Little League camp in the morning. Uh, middle school has been having their spring practices going on. We've had our spring practices going on. And see some of my guys that I know several of you are alumni, but some of my guys that's practicing with the alumni team that's got a game next month with Grace. So just about every level of football is being uh, – being played or, or talked about right now. So what we want to do is kind of get that going in the right direction as we get into summer, okay, because you know how it is once the season gets started, things move fast and uh, you know, it'll be time to roll, okay? So I'll go ahead, Coach Morris, if you want to kind of share some things offensively, he'll get on the board. And like I say, guys, ask us questions, okay? Me, Coach Morris, Andrew, Coach Cleaver, be glad to help you on some stuff. 
Um, what I did for y'all is basically what we're trying to do. Some of you, I know a lot of you may have played in this system in Marshall County. And I came from Mayfield, which when I played for my dad, uh, Jack Morris, we played, we were old school football. We lined down and we ran the football. And I think that's what we have to do here to be successful. I just don't think the spread offense is what we need to do. And I'm not saying some of the stuff that we're doing at the high school level, obviously, you know, third, fourth graders, you know, are not going to be able to do that. And that's fine. But what we want to try to do offensively for you all is try to implement some of the formations that we're using. Where the terminology, they know they hear the same formation that they hear all the way going up through the elementary school, through the middle school, and then when they get to the high school. And what I've done, I've just made like different sets. And you don't have to use all of them, obviously. If you want to use, like I've got wishbone drawn up. If you want to use wishbone, great. If you want to use, you know, two tight ends and two flankers and a one back, whatever, it doesn't matter. But what we're going to do, we're, we're, our philosophy is, and I've talked to Coach Merrick about it, we're going to do very few plays, 10 plays maybe at the most at the high school level. And we're, we've, we're going to implement the triple option, the veer. Some of you done it, some of you haven't done it. If you haven't, I'd be happy to sit down with you and talk to you about what we're doing, go on the board with you and show you exactly how we're blocking it. The blocking schemes are very, very simple. I mean, honestly, it is, you got, you got two rules. That's it for offensive linemen. And that's what, that's what I wanted to make. Our kids need to understand this. You know, football is a simple game. It's about blocking and tackling. And that's it. Once they get up there, they know exactly what to do, and then they can play and not think. We don't want them to think. That's the worst thing we do. That's our job as a coach. We got to think and we got to get them prepared. So, like I say, if y'all want to take one of these and pass them around, so again, <coughs> use them at your discretion and try, try to implement, if you can, try to implement the terminology where you know, these kids know, hey, I got wishbone, I know what I'm getting into. I'm two tight ends, I'm three backs, and we're coming right at you. Or if I'm in an ace set or if I'm in a flex set, you know, and like I say, I wrote out how we're calling it, how we're calling on the field. And like I say, we're, we're going to have about 10 plays, but we're going to try to use several formations. And we're going to try to spread the field and then just not block people. And if any of you know about the veer, you know you don't have to block people, okay? And that's, that's kind of the advantage we think is going to be good for us here at Marshall County. We feel like right now this year, well, we've had spring ball here for six practices now. Um, you know, we've only done it for three days, the offensive side. So it's still, you know, we're still in, you know, taking baby steps here. The kids are still learning. But I think they, they can see, you know, there's a flicker there, and I think they can see what's going on. And they can see how it works. When a play opens up, they can see, wow, you know, we didn't block these two guys, but we still get six yards. It's kind of crazy. So, you know, again, you can do some of this beer stuff with probably fifth and sixth graders. I'm not saying, you know, running down and pitching the ball. I'm not saying these kids can do that. If you've got a, a really good athlete quarterback, you know, if you've got a really good athlete on your team, try to make that person quarterback if he's underweight. I get the weight thing. I know it's a problem sometimes. But if you have a kid that you feel like is your best athlete, your best runner, we want him to be quarterback or at least fullback, one or the other, if, if the weight limit's correct, okay? That's how we want to kind of start. That's how we start our offense here. Um, like I say, the... The formations are key right now. If you need to implement any plays, what I'm going to try to do, and I told Coach Merrick, I will get a watered-down version, a playbook of what we're doing, just the basic stuff, okay? You know, we call as we call our plays, we're running midline. If you don't know what midline is, you know, it's just basically it's right up the center's butt. It's, that's how we're running the football. We're running dead behind the center. We're not blocking, you know, the guard that's to the play side. Uh, we're running inside and outside beer. We're running a rocket toss, a little toss play out of it, out of certain formations. And, you know, we will have a couple of zone dives and things like that, but, and we'll have, you know, a few pass plays. But honestly, if I throw it 10 times in a game, that's going to be about max out here, the high school level, okay? That's our plan. That's kind of what we've set on. That's what I talked to Coach Merrick about when I decided to come on. And, um, you know, I'm excited about it. The kids seem excited about it. I hope your kids kind of catch on to it, but if you know, like I say, I'll be happy to help any, anybody. If you need me to come talk to your kids or something someday while you're practicing, um, either get my number from Coach Merrick or call me or call Shane. He's got my number. I'd be happy to come out and talk to your kids, okay? Anything I can do to help. We're all here in this together, and we want this program to build from, the, you know, what you guys are doing is, is incredibly important, whether you believe it or not. We got to start at a certain point, and they have to see that, okay, we need to stay to keep these kids together. We're losing kids a lot of times, I think, in the middle school level. And then when they get to high school, they decide to go play something else. 
soccer, basketball, whatever, which is fine. But, you know, we want them to be a part of the football team if, if that's what they want to do. You know, football is one of those sports where, you know, if you don't want to play, if you really don't like contact, you probably don't need to play football. It's just one of those things. But we need those kids. If we can get those kids out, we want them with us, okay? Um, if, like I say, I'll be, I'm here for you if you need anything I can do. Um, like I say, if I need to get on the board and show you a couple plays, I'd be happy to. You just tell me, and we'll do it tonight, and we can do it another time. But, um, again, thank you. That's all I have, Coach. Okay. Appreciate it, guys. Hey, yes, sir. You did say you was going to probably put together a I will. scale down paper. Yeah, I'm working on it right now. I've got, I, I gave our coaches kind of what I wanted to do, the base plays that we're going to do at the high school. And there's some more we can implement, you know, just little changes. But you know, I, I can give you, like, you know, some wishbone plays that I grew up in that I think are still very effective. And it's all this beer stuff, just the basic stuff. You know, and if you want to run the beer stuff, you can call See, we're reading. We're actually reading a defensive lineman. Obviously, your kid's not going to be able to do that, okay? So you can just call like a, a give, or you can fake it and have a quarterback run. You know, just you can call it a give or a keep. So, but it's the same type block. Let the kids, you know, let the kids come off and see the blocking styles and, and the types that we're doing. But um, like I say, it's, it's, it is very basic, very, very simple. And if, you know, your kids ought to be able to see that. If they can identify who not to block when they line up, they can figure it out. Again, if you want to just base block it, that's perfect, perfectly fine too. I have no problem with that. And most of your kids are gonna see that. Okay, block the guy in front of you, perfect. Run the ball, but you know, again, you can do some different things out of it. But like I said, if I, if I can help you, I will. All right, thanks, Kelly. You bet. <laughs> okay, guys, I know some of you faces look familiar. Some of you I coached, was a part of the coaching staff when you played through here. I've been around this program for a long time, but I traced my program, I traced my football and my love for the game of football to 1974. I was on a little league football team, and my coach was Philip Rudd. I don't know if you know any of you know Philip, but Philip coached little league at Benton. I didn't know the difference between. I, I thought when he said to put your cup in, that I was supposed to go to the water fountain and find something to uh, something styrofoam. That's what I knew about the game of football. I grew up in. Callaway County, never got to play the game until I was in the sixth grade when we moved to Marshall County. But I trace, and I remember, I still have those memories back to when I played for Phillip at the park. We used to tackle the foam pole because we couldn't afford any bags to tackle, so he would find a foam pole and we would tackle the foam pole. You know, so, so uh, football in Marshall County has come a long way since then. And, but I can still, like I said, I can still look back those memories of those times that coaching and coaching and playing for for Philip, you still have that same influence on those kids. You don't realize, you don't realize that until they grow up and they look back fondly on their little league time and say, yeah, he coached me, he's my coach. He'll still come up to me and, and you know, Walmart, whatever, every time I see Philip, he'll come up to me, we'll talk, still have a relationship years later and you'll have that over them as well. Uh, of course, I know we're gonna give you a lot of X's and O's for me. It's the X's. I don't get to do much with the O's. Uh, I'm usually in the box on Friday nights trying to watch what the other team does. When it comes to offense, they don't ever ask me anything about what to do offensively because I've coached defense for so long. I know a lot of things we're going to give you are things that we do, and we're going to look at on the you know alignments and things like that, and probably this is where some of you are going to be right now. You're going to be teaching these kids the basics of the game. So if anything that I give you, you're welcome to use. It's what we do at, at this level. But believe me, we still have this issue at our level at times, okay? Kids that come in and play for the first time, even some kids that, uh, you know, change positions, they don't know what to do. We get to spend our spring right now trying to teach them that. Um, I can remember coming over my first job here at Marshall County. It was in uh, uh, 19, uh, 1990. Jim Shelton took the head coaching job. He hired me over from Grace County. And I've been, of course, I grew up here, played here. But uh, I really thought going in that I knew what was, what was going on. I knew all about coaching. And I didn't realize that, you know, I had to teach a whole lot more basics than what I ever thought I would. Uh, but uh, just know how much you're appreciated, how much we think about you. You're willing to give your time, your dedication to these kids and uh, prepare them for the future.
Okay, if you'll notice throughout there, I've got you know this is kind of a uh, watered down playbook of what you know kind of used over the years. Uh, I had the fortunate to coach with Paul Brewster for a long time as an assistant when he was assistant here and I was assistant here together. And Paul always could come up with some kind of line to dedicate uh, to, to motivate the, the kids into playing, the, the players into playing. A lot of those are still mixed into my playbooks. If you look through there, you'll find some of uh, some of the same things that Paul used to write when he was here. But our base alignment, of course, to an offensive line, we have a right and a left. Our even numbers, as far as our holes, are to our left side. You know, you can see that. I can't get a little bit on the screen at a time, so sorry for walking back in front of some of you. But a lot of all times, offensively, the even colors will be the right, the odd colors will be the back to the left. We don't have an even and odd, we have a strong and a weak. And our linebackers make the decision on whether or not the, the, the call is to the strong side or the weak side. So we call our first gap on either side of the center of the A gaps. One gap out is the B gap, the next gap out is the C gap, and then if we have a tight end, we also have a D gap. Our strength call is to the tight end. If we have one, that's our first rule is our linebackers to make that call. So we'll have a strong side A and a weak side A. We have a strong side B and a weak side B. We have a strong side C and a weak side C. Our alignments kind of come from some old school as far as really where this goes back to is as far back as the old uh, Alabama when Bear Bryant was there. That's where these numbering system kind of came about. And uh, we've kind of stayed with that same, same idea since. Anytime we've got a guy lined up on the nose, we call that a zero if he's heads up. If he's going to shade strong, we would call it a shade, just a strong shade or a weak shade. And then we move over to our guards. We have a one, a two, and a three. We always try to keep our even numbers nose up. It's easier for the kids to remember it. We call our defense based on the alignment that we want our defensive tackles to be on our, on our guards. A two is nose up. We're going to put the nose of our defensive tackle on the nose of the guard. If we want an inside shade, we would call it a one. Move in a half a gap. Hopefully you don't have to shade all the way into the gap, but we'll change our shade week to week based on the opponents that we play. So we kind of we say we're at a one and we're on the inside shade of our guard. An outside shade would be a three. So if the two's nose up, one is inside, three is outside. Then we move out to the tackles. Well, we go from two, we go to four. We try to make it as simple as we can. So we call a four, we're going to go outside as a five, but we can't go to the three because we've already used that number. So we call it an I. So a four I would be four is nose up, eyes inside. Two, four, the next even number is a six. If we were to have a tight end, nose up would be in a six technique. If we're inside, we would do a six I. If we're outside, we would do a seven. We call a nine is really our ghost end. It may walk up, play outside. We would have to, may have to do that sometime with our monster back in order to, to stop a, te a team that's over sweeping on the outside. So that's our base information that all our kids have to know because our, our defensive linemen have to know, am I in a two eye, am I a, or, sorry, am I a one, I'm a two, I'm a four eye. And it, it's determined by the strength and the that the linebackers make at the line of scrimmage. Okay. You can read through the basic rules that I've got there of defense and some things that we try to teach and emphasize with our, with our front, with our secondary. Okay. Our base defense that we call is a 31. Now, I've coached some of you at defensive tackles. I know what some of you, how you thought when you were in, middle, when you were in uh, high school and how some of our tackles think now. We make it as easy on the defensive tackles as we can. One of them plays a three, the other plays a one. That's when we call it 31. If we want the other one to play a one and a three, we call it 13. If we want to call it, if we want to make a, a head up call, we call it 22. We tell the defensive tackles where to line up. Everybody else has got to be smart enough to know. Okay? Do what? <laughs> a lot of times we had to get the linebacker to line Kendall up. He had to get his butt and just move him and put him where he needed to be when he played D line. But our idea is the numbers tell our defensive tackles where to go. Our defensive ends will always play a five technique 
if they're to a split inside, if they have a tight end, they widen a half a man and play a six side, which is the inside shade of the, of the tight end. The Mike linebacker, of course our Mike is our strong linebacker. Uh, our strong linebacker goes to the strength side and plays the gal opposite the defensive tackle. So in this case, this is our 31. Our tackle is in a three technique to our strength side. It's our strength because of tight end. That's our number one rule because we declare our strength to our run strength. Because up front, we got to worry about run first, pass later. <coughs> so we make our call to the left side because our tight end is on the left side. That means if this is a 31, this tackle is in a three. This end, we have a tight end, so this end plays a six eye. He's inside of this. This tackle would play a one. He's shaded to the inside. The defensive end to the split inside always plays a five. Now, of course, we can put a lot of different stunts in there. I'm just going to go over the basic stuff. Our Mike linebacker then, since this guy is in, the, is in a three, it automatically gives that tackle the gap that he's lined up in. We're a gap control defense. If we get a run into a gap, we know which guy's responsible for it. If we want to stunt, run a stunt with any of our uh, front, we want them to stunt for the most part into the gap that they're lined up for. We do have a few cross stunts, but for the most part, if this tackle is in a three technique, he's B gap responsible. If this tackle is a one, he's A gap responsible. The Mike and the Will, Mike for strong side, Will for weak side, they take the gap that the tackle doesn't have. So in this case, since this tackle's in a three, this Mike is in a one, but he's off the ball. And we play some different, we look at the Mike and the wheel, the depth alignment, week to week. This year we're going to go four yards off the ball with our linebackers. The reason being is because their guards are covered. Last year we ran a five front with a nose. The guards were uncovered. I backed the linebackers off the ball where they could run a little bit before the, the guard had that straight shot at them. But in this case, since this tackle has a one, the width, or has the A, this wheel would have the B. The N has the C. Our monster out here would be in the coverage, reading, reading run. He's a force player. He's a contained player inside. This end is in the six eye. He's got the C gap responsibility. This monster linebacker would have the D. He would have the force or the contain from the outside. And once again, his alignment is going to be based on where these backs are and how far they're out, their coverage is outside. If we go to a 13, the only thing that reverses in 13 is the two tackles. It's a one and a three. A one to the mic, to the mic side, a, uh, a three to the weak side this time, to the wheel side. Our mic and our wheel linebackers have to be the smartest people on the field because they got to make sure these guys are right because if he's in the wrong gap, we can't have two guys playing the same gap. If the tackle in a 13 here, this tackle's in a one, he's got the A gap. My mic then that puts him in the B gap, it gets him a little wider. So a lot of times if we're playing a team that runs a lot of tight end, we'll play a little bit more 13 because it gets my mic a little bit wider. Still got gap coverage. There's not a gap on the field that's open. Somebody's responsible for that gap. Now we don't stunt that gap every time, we do every now and then, but he's got to eye that gap. Anything flow into that gap, he's got to attack. Same way with the mic. Anything into my gap, I got to attack. We don't waste ourselves, but we read through that gap to the backfield. Same way with our tackles. We're playing that gap, but we're getting a good piece of this guard, getting maybe a yard penetration, because if we come way upfield, then we get a team that's going to trap us out. So it's a gap responsibility defense, but it's not like you shoot the gap. We're going to play that gap, we're going to sit in that gap, and we're going to make sure nothing's running in that gap. So does weak side monster, does he play pass first, and the strong side monster is playing? Our, our weak side monster, so really our, our monsters, have to play both yeah. contain and pass drop. And I put in the pass coverages, a couple of pass coverages here in just a few minutes. Of course, we've got a bunch of different coverages that we run out of, out of our secondary. When we consider these two guys part of our secondary, I'll show you a couple of them a little bit later on. But this guy is reading through, he's reading quarterback through the backfield. He sees any kind of a flow this way, then he's got to drop into the flat area, pick any kind of a hook out here in the flat, his, his responsibility would be out here. But if he reads this quick handoff or a quick dive, quick pitch sweep, he's coming. 
He's got to sit the corner. He's called a force player because he wants to force everything inside. Okay, we call it force because we want to. You know, I've heard the word contain. I used to use the word contain. He's got contain. Well, what does contain mean? That means okay, he's going to go inside of me. If contain, I can contain with this guy. If I run out here, he's going to go inside of me. And I've had some guys over the years that have done that. Okay, I tell him to play contain. Well, coach, he's inside of me. I contain. So we call it force because we want to force it inside as much as we can, okay? But his job is to read through, keep everything inside of me. He has gap responsibility, but he also has zone comp uh, responsibility or man responsibility in the pass. Same way the Mike and Will. If he's Mike and Wills, they're going to step up and play pass first. But if they read, I mean, sorry, run first, but if they read pass, they have pass zone responsibility. But with those front inside six, they've got to play run first. We will play a 22. Now with our 22, we're going to move those tackles. Okay? We very seldom will have a tackle that's good enough. No offense to tackles over the years. But we very seldom have a tackle that's good enough that can play this guy heads up and play double gaps. Because he's not lined up in a gap, so he can't be gap responsible for it. If we played on base up, he would have to play double gap responsibility and the Mike and Will would have to clean it up. So we don't do a whole lot of base out of 22. We will slant them out of 22. A slant strong, the Mike would make the call. The two tackles would go to the strong side. Our Mike and Will has to know which gap they've got to pick up. If it's a slant strong, then our two tackles are going to the Mike side. This guy would go into the B gap. This guy would go into the A gap. This guy, these two guys would pick up the two gaps that they don't. We do have a, in this case in 22, we get a team that runs weak. Then we'll, we'll go 22 and we'll slant weak. Okay, that means my tackles are going away from the mic. They're going to both go into the gap to the right, to the weak side. This would go, a guy would go into the A, this guy would go into the B. Mike and Will just don't have to know, have to know, have to know what gap to pick up. Okay, we also pinch out of that. Pinch is inside. Two tackles would go A gaps. Mike and Will would play the B gaps, and we also have a fan call. In fan, you know, if you think about a fan, a fan opens this way, we would open our tackles. We would go B gaps with our tackles, and our Mike and Will would play the A gaps. So we, we kind of use this as more of a movement defense. We do do a lot of, we do some slanting and, and some stuff out of the 31, but in this case, when we slant out of the 31, you got to cross a guy's face. It gives you a little bit of disadvantage in D tackle, but with the slant, out of, with, our, with a slant out of two technique, you never know where to go. You never know where we're going. So we try to do that quite a bit, especially if we want to do something weak side or do something inside. You know, some of this stuff, if we look at this, of course I know what, uh, what Coach Morris is trying to do with uh, offensively this year. We've run a midline option in some of those plays. You know, so what I'm trying to do, because I run the scout team as well, is I'm trying to think, what can I do to stop him? Okay, this is what we can do would, would do the counter with his inside is we'd go into 22 and we would try to pitch inside or we would do something to stop some of his plays. Because once again, that's one of those breakdown things that we do every week after we look at film to see what a team does. Uh, but we do a lot of variation out of those, those three defenses. Some of you guys that played in some of the early years with Jim, when Jim was the head coach, uh, this is what we ran. We ran the old 50 defense, okay? We still went with that with some last year because we were blessed last year that we had a lot of skilled people, but our number of D linemen wasn't, we, we didn't have a bulk bunch of defensive linemen. So we wanted our best athletes on the field, so we went with a 50, <clears throat> and since we had so many people that didn't play a tight end, we could play more secondary people here and really play three defensive linemen. It was just a thing that we did last year just simply because personnel that we had. This year we're fortunate enough, we got more big guys up front because our, some of our, a lot of our skilled people graduated, so we're going back to more of a forefront this week because this year because we got to stop the run, number one. Of course out of our 50 technique, most a lot of, like you said, some of you guys I know played with when Jim was here, we play a, a nose up, we play a defensive tackle, a single defensive tackle, and uh, play him on the nose. Now, sometimes we will shade him strong, shade him weak. It's according to really what, a, what the tendency of a team is going to do. 
Out of two splits, we would play two five techniques. Once again, if we got some teams that coming in that, that are going to run inside at us, you know, a lot of teams will line up and spread, but they still want to be a run team. We may bring these guys into four eyes to play the B gaps. Uh, that way our Mike and Will can free them up a little bit. But that's really just the old 50 defense that we that, that we ran years ago. Okay? The Mike's still got the monsters outside playing force, playing flats. Um, in this case, you know, we took a defensive tackle out, we bring a strong safety in. This strong safety can 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 do a whole lot of things. We can do some different coverages of things with that extra defensive back in the game. I put in a couple of our coverages. Like I said, we have a lot of different uh, coverages. Uh, Miami, Michigan, a lot of things like that. It, it takes a lot of work, uh, a lot of skill level in order to go through that. So I just want to couple, go a couple of basic ones. There. This is, to me, at the younger level, uh, I like to run it all the way up through the freshman level because very seldom you will have a strong arm quarterback that, can, that you can't stop a cover three with. <clears throat> now when you get on Friday nights, and you're running against uh, Lagging from Christian County, or you're running against a uh, uh, quarterback from Grace County, can throw the football really well, then we can't play a whole lot of cover three because that's, they'll go four deeps on three. Uh, we used to run this against Mayfield. Mayfield used to kill us in the cover three because they had a guy right here with enough speed that he could run deep on it. You know, he could stretch his four wide, and that's, the, that's a drawback out of a dragon defense. But our idea in our dragon coverage is three deep. The corner, the free safety, and this corner has the deep third of the field. The best way that I can describe it for a young kid is I tell them you play baseball. You're either playing center field, you're playing right field or left field. Now unfortunately I said that to one kid last year and he said, he said, Coach, I've never played baseball in my life. And I said, never mind. We'll have to figure something else out. But that's the best way that I describe this is this is baseball. This is left field, this is center field, this is right field. Okay, I have two monsters to play. So we're playing three in, three deep, four under. Two monsters have curled a flat, they're eyeing number two, and they're trying to get their width. Okay, so that way if it's something quick, screen here, he can come up on it. So he's eyeing number two. He's got curl to flat. These guys have hooked the curl. When they open, they're going to read first. They're going to step up and play run first. They read pass. He's going to drop back, looking out here to number two, because that's the first guy that can come to his zone. Open up, look there, and he's playing the curl uh, zone here. Mike would do it to the strong side of the field. Okay, that's our that's our base, one of our base coverages. We call it dragon. Over the years, it's been called a lot of different things. Cover three. Uh, I think we one time it was called, we called it orange here. Uh, one time we called it base because that was just what we ran. You know, that was our base coverage when I first started here. So we ran cover three. Then we started having to get creative. Um, so we had to do some different looks and, and adjust into things, but uh, it's one of our coverages that we will use quite a bit. And once again, at the younger level, where you don't have a strong arm quarterback that can beat you by uh, running four verts at you, it's a very good secondary coverage. Our zombie is our man coverage. Okay, our zombie is our man coverage. Now I've got this drone out of a two by two, our A set. Once again, it will work out of any of these things. Our idea here is we're going to man under, or we're going to man underneath, and we're going to have somebody high over the top. So our corners are going to man up with number one. Our monsters are going to man up with number two. Our Mike and Will, we have one running back in the box. He's my Mike and Will's like guy. If he comes to the Mike side, my Mike's got him. He comes to the Will side, my Will's got him. The guy that doesn't have a man sits in the middle for one of these guys that lose their man across the, uh, across the middle to help out. <clears throat> if they were to come in with a tight end, we would have to make some different adjustments. We also run our stunts out of this coverage. Because why? I've got a free guy. So if I'm going to run a monster stunt with this guy, somebody's got to get his man. He's our fit guy. He's going to come up and fit with number two. If I'm running a stunt with this guy, he's got to come fit this guy. We, we can run a stunt with our wide guy. Used to call this cannon years ago. He would come in and shoot off the edge because he's looking at this guy. Our free, our free safety has got to cover this guy's man. Now we can run a micro wheel stunt without going to a, a true locked man because we do have an extra linebacker. I just know if I send my mic out of this, Will's got to have him no matter where he's at. If I send my wheel, Mike's got him no matter where he's at. 
We will also run a fire stunt out of this. Our fire stunt is this guy running a stunt and everybody else locking man. You'd be surprised how many people can't find that guy. Because he's smaller, he can slip up and hide behind the linebackers, and he's going to be through a gap because he's usually quick and he's small. He can find that opening, and once again, we just lock man. So he's kind of our fit guy out of our, uh, out of our true uh, uh, zombie coverage. If we were to go two in the box, let's suppose this mind man goes in the box, and they run a two-back set. Or Mike and Will have all backs in the backfield. Mike's got one to his side. Will's got one to his side. This guy doesn't have a guy anymore. He can drop back and we can play two high safeties. Once again, we would lock, we would lock. He would come back, play two high safeties. They'd split the difference. They would lock here. Okay. We ran this coverage against, when I was at Callaway, the D quarter at Callaway. We went to the Final Four. We were in a regional championship game. Got the team of Mallet County was throwing on us, moving the football down the field. We went to this coverage, slipped our quarterback in at free safety, made an interception, won the ball game. We won the region on that one. So this is a good coverage to have because you can do so much out of it. So many people can stunt, so many people can call it, can cover for them. Once again, two in the backfield gives you another, gives you two free. One in the backfield, you got one high free. Is our base out of that? Okay. Once again, that is, uh, that's our base stuff. We have a whole lot more. Anytime you, you guys want to talk defense, uh, if, you call, if you want to talk offense, you'll have to see Coach Boris. Uh, but anytime you want to talk defense, uh, feel free to give me a call. Uh, I work, uh, work over in the Second Chance School. Uh, send me, drop me an email, go to the school site, drop me an email. I can set some time for you. You can come in. If you've got time during the day, you're more welcome to come up. We go back in the back office. I get somebody to watch a class. We can talk football anytime, any, as much as you want to talk football. Once again, I can't tell you guys enough how much it means to me. I know Coach Merrick means a lot to Coach Merrick too, but I've been around this program for a lot of years, guys. I don't have a, probably a whole lot of years left in me as far as coaching goes. But I'm going to support this program as long as I can. I've been to some other schools, but guys, there's no place like home. There's no place like wearing the orange. Can't thank Coach Merrick enough for letting me come back, finish my career out coaching here again. I uh, do want one thing that I want you to look at. Uh, and I want to leave it with you. Leave it with you. Uh, and once again, guys, I, a lot of things I got, a lot of things I learned was from the older coaches. You know, I, I grew up, I played for Jim, I played for Coach Krause, I, I played for Doc. When he was here, uh, coach with Jim, coach with Paul Brewster, coach with Randy Stafford for a long time. And those old coaches taught me what I know. You know, don't be afraid to come around anytime that you want to talk to any of us. Anything that I can do to give you a little bit of, of 30 plus years of football experience, I'm more than welcome to do that. I'd love to sit down with you. One thing that I've always tried when I got into coaching years ago is I kind of found this, really Coach Brewster gave it to me, uh, it's Bill of Rights for Young Athletes. And one thing that I have to try to remember, and even when I was a head coach out here years ago, I had to always keep telling myself, these are kids. Even the, even the, the seniors that are seniors are still high school kids. Okay? They're to be treated like high school kids. They're to be respected like high school kids. Okay? I couldn't vote work for a coach that browbeat their kids, that, that demeaned their kids. Fortunately, we don't have a coaching staff here that does that. We're here to support those kids. But these kids have a right, have rights, and these are things that I've gone by because they've decided to give up their time. Now, years ago, I used to, I remember when I had Kendall, I used to say, guys, y'all are special because all these, everybody else is at home watching Gilligan's Island eat bologna sandwich. Nobody today knows who, who Gilligan's Island is, so I have to change some of my, you know, things that I say because they look at me now like, who in the heck are you talking about, Coach? But Kendall's still special. He <laughs> <laughs> yeah. is, in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways. But guys, this is the this is the one that I always go by, and that's number ten. No matter what I say to these kids, and I remember two years ago I had a freshman team at Grace County, and we were in a, a fighting match with them. 
And of course, I had got my dandruff up and I was yelling at them. Guys, you got to understand what they're trying to do. I was telling them this, telling them that, and they had that look in their eyes. And finally, I just had to stop and say, guys, football's supposed to be fun. Get out there and play your butt off, but you have the right to have fun. If it's not fun, guys, we're doing it for the wrong reasons. So remember that when you take them to the field, make it fun for them. Make them love the sport of football. Make them fall in love with it so they'll stay with it. So if they're first graders right now, for 11 years they're going to be part of our program. If they're second graders, for 10 more years they're going to be part of this program. Make them love this game. I appreciate it once again this chance to come out and talk to you a little bit. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to come by anytime. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, Coach Cleaver. Like I said, you know, that's stuff for you guys to use. And, and these guys, me, Coach Morris, Coach Cleaver, myself, we want to be a resource to you. Like we said, this time of year is a time where we can put more time and devote to it in the spring. But again, contact us anytime. We'll be more than happy to help you guys along the way. Now, what I want to go ahead and show you guys now is uh, this is what is what USA Football calls a heads-up certification video. And this is strictly for... I mean, you know, the teaching tackle, okay? The CLC Hawks hit Hawk tackling in 2015, and <coughs> try to keep the, take the head out of the game, prevent head and neck injuries, and prevent concussion. Hi, this is Coach Pete Carroll of the Seattle Seahawks, and thanks to the leadership of assistant head coach Rocky Seto, we've produced our 2015 tackling video. This is an updated edition of the tackling video we released last year, and it features some new points of emphasis and a review of the foundational elements of our tackling system. As we all know, basic fundamentals must be taught and reviewed constantly. This is a system we've been teaching and utilizing for the last five years at the Seahawks and since our days at SC. To summarize, the tackling system features leverage-based shoulder tackling and a major emphasis on taking the head out of tackling. We strike with our leverage shoulder and keep our helmets on our leverage side but out of the tackle. We found our style to be successful in the league and in college and we believe it could be employed on all levels. We're passionate about teaching this style of tackling because we desire to keep the standards of the game high and make the game as safe as possible. Our tackling system has been inspired by those who play rugby around the world and rugby players have done a tremendous job of taking the head out of their game and they truly exemplify shoulder tackling. You will see several clips of rugby tackling throughout this film. The following video will contain information on tracking, compression tackles, hawk tackles, hawk lift tackles, and profile tackles. We'll go into each teaching point more in depth later on in the video. The basis of our passion in this video is to maintain the physical integrity of the game while developing safer tackling techniques. We desire to play the game as tough as it is meant to be played while also making the game safer. We hope you'll find this interesting and you'll enjoy watching the following film. Tracking. We're a shoulder tackling team based on leverage, so we must own and maintain our leverage. To do this, we track the near hip of the ball carrier. Our tackling system begins with tracking because we focus on shoulder tackling based on leverage. We focus on a technique called run and gather, where a player tracks the near hip of the ball carrier as he closes in on the tackle. Here, number 29 does his run and gather technique as he tracks the ball carrier in, into the flat. In practice, linebackers go through a run and gather tracking drill. Here in the game, Number 50 comes from inside out leverage position and tracks the ball carrier into the perimeter. In practice, number 54 works on tracking a running back in man-to-man -man coverage. Then in the game, number 54 tracks the near hip of the ball carrier and makes the tackle. A new highlighted emphasis in this video is the near foot concept. As we track the near hip, we like to get into a near foot swoop position. In this game tape, three players do not get their near foot up and it locks their leverage side hip and prevents them from maintaining their leverage. In practice, number 50 gets into a near foot swoop position as he prepares to tackle into a crash pad. In the Super Bowl, number 31 uses near foot swoop as he gets ready to engage the ball carrier and makes the tackle. 
Maintaining the near foot swoop position allows you to maintain your leverage and it also puts the tackler in the best and strongest position to deliver a forceful strike on the ball carrier. Here are several more examples of the near foot swoop in action. Compression tackles. Compression tackles are all about owning your hip, as we call it. Owning your hip means dominating your leverage. We'll hit with our leverage shoulder and keep our helmets to the leverage side. In this drill, number 54 and number 31 practice tracking the near hip while keeping their near foot swoop position as they learn to work with each other to perform a compression tackle. Number 31 and number 29 make a textbook compression tackle very similar to the drill. Here's a compression tackle drill with a moving target. Notice how number 58 works hard to maintain his leverage as he adjusts to that moving target. Here's another example of a compression tackle in the game. And here, number 25 and number 29 make a compression tackle in the flat. Notice how both players are tracking the hip and getting into strong near foot swoop position. Hawk tackles. A hawk tackle is our basic fundamental tackle that we want to revisit from our first tackling video. Hawk tackles are shoulder tackles targeting the thighs of the ball carrier, where the defender focuses his eyes at thigh level. We do this by coaching eyes to the thighs, wrap and squeeze the legs and drive for five when necessary. The following plays show prime examples of ideal hawk tackles. Here's a practice drill of players imagining the thigh level of a ball carrier, targeting the sled and making a left shoulder hawk tackle. Cross face hawk tackles. Cross face hawk tackles are where the ball carrier works against the tackler's leverage. Therefore, our helmets will be across the ball carrier since we keep our helmets on our leverage side. In this play, number 31 makes a right shoulder cross face hawk tackle as the ball carrier cuts back into his leverage. Number 31 attempts to make an outside-in right shoulder hawk tackle, which turns into a cross-face tackle when the ball carrier cuts back into his leverage. In this play, number 29 comes from inside-out leverage and maintains his leverage by making a left shoulder cross-face hawk tackle. Number 25 makes a right shoulder cross-face hawk tackle because the ball carrier is cutting back into his leverage. Hawk Lift Tackle The Hawk Lift Tackle is a new emphasis added since the previous tackling video. We still target the ball carrier with the leveraged shoulder and then we lift with the off hand. Number 29 makes a left shoulder hit and then lifts with his right hand, the off hand from his hitting shoulder. Left shoulder hit, right hook. Number 50 makes a right shoulder hit, left hook. Here's a left shoulder hit, right hook in rugby. Number 31 makes a right shoulder hit, left hook. Left shoulder hit, right hook. Right shoulder hit, left hook. Number 41 makes a left shoulder hit with a right hook. Here are several more examples of hawk lift tackles where the emphasis is making contact with our leveraged shoulder and lifting with our off hand. In practice, number 20 makes a right shoulder hit and hooks with his left hand, his off hand. Number 54 makes a hawk lift tackle in this game footage. Profile tackle. A profile tackle is a shoulder tackle targeting the near peck. We wrap and drive for five when necessary. Here, number 72 makes a left shoulder profile tackle as he targets the near peck and drives the ball carrier to the ground. Here are several more profile tackles from both football and rugby.
This drill highlights targeting the near peck, wrapping up and driving for five. Notice number 95, wrap up and drive for five. Here are several more examples of profile tackles. Number 54 makes a profile tackle in the backfield. In this drill, players work on profile tackles by targeting the near peck and driving for five. Number 50 makes an inside out right shoulder profile tackle. Here are a couple examples of a cross face profile tackle. Number 29 coming from his inside out leverage position makes a left shoulder cross face profile tackle. Number 54 is also in an inside out leverage position and makes a cross face profile tackle. A highlighted emphasis in our profile tackles is the shoulder punch. Here are a few examples of shoulder punches. Here, drive for five is the emphasis on running your feet through the contact. Here are some examples. In conclusion, thank you for joining us for the second edition of our tackling video. We hope you learned the value of shoulder tackling and the importance of taking the head out of the game. We would love to hear your feedback as we continue this dialogue and help make this great sport even better for generations to come. Thank you. Tell you about a few changes that we're going to be looking at. Uh, number one, we, we have confirmation that we're going to be able to use the four locations. Yes. Okay. We're going to be able to use four practice locations this year. So we're, we, we end up with four teams, you, you know, four colored teams. We're going to have four locations to practice. That way we got room to spread out. We'll be utilizing South Marshall. H.H. Lovett, North Marshall, and the practice field out here at the high school. So first and, uh, first and second, third and fourth, and fifth and sixth team will be at each location. So we won't have two fifth and sixth grade teams at one location. So that will give you plenty of room to spread out. Um, right now we're still looking at doing a jamboree like we did last year, six game season. Ending right before fall break, we, won't, we will not have games the weekend before fall break. We'll have a full fall break, no games the, the weekend after fall break, and then we'll come back, week of practice, uh, playoff rounds, and then a week of practice and the championship game for the teams that are left. Um, as far as when we're looking at starting, I mean, it's pretty well set in stone. I just got to remember the date. What was it? August? Uh, August the 11th will be equipment day. That'll be the Saturday after school starts. So the right. school will start on a Thursday. That gives us time. One of the reasons why we did it was it gives us time to get our teams set. You know, like I said, you know, have a couple days of school, get some of those late sign-ups in. Of course, we're going to have sign-ups this uh, weekend at camp. We'll have the online sign-ups as well. To try to get your teams in order so where you can get started, you'll be ready to roll going into the Jamboree. Yeah, and that's a little bit later. You're actually only going to have one week of practice going into the Jamboree. But remember, we're all in the same, we're all in this together. We're all, nobody is going to have an advantage be any further ahead than anyone else. And we did talk about, I've talked about that first week that we could practice more days than just Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. So if we practice Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then we still haven't decided on whether or not we would say that we could that Friday or Saturday as a, like a, just a, in shorts, uh, we'll have to finalize that. But we're gonna try to get you a few more practices in that first week where it's as close as having six practices 
within the two week period. Um, we'll let everybody know once we finalize. Um, we have sent all the helmets except for the new 60 helmets we put in service last year off for reconditioning, something we've never done in our little league. They're gonna come back orange. We're gonna have that for the third and fourth and fifth and sixth graders. And we're gonna keep the first and second graders in white helmets. When we finish this year, then we're gonna send those off for conditioning. They'll come back orange. We're gonna to transition to getting everybody in orange helmets. What I'm gonna ask is when I get those helmets back, I'm gonna send out a text and see who could help come help me on a Saturday or a Sunday afternoon to get all the pads back in the helmets as well as we've got some new equipment. We bought for each location, we bought the uh, uh, tackling wheels, but as well as we bought a set of ropes, uh, as well and, and the stands for all four locations and we're gonna get those put together. So I'm just gonna have a little work day for those that can come out and if enough people come, maybe for an hour or two to get all this set back up and ready for the season. Um, one thing I'm going to say it now, I'm going to say it on equipment day, and I'll say it when we take up equipment. One thing we got to start paying attention to, all of us as coaches and help with this, is that we get all our equipment back, including chin strap. What we noticed this year was is that between last year and this year, we got we did not get we are we got shorted basically 83 chin straps, and at twelve dollars a chin strap, that's about a thousand dollars. And that's money we could be spending somewhere else. What happens is each, they'll get the helmet and the chin strap, they'll go buy their own chin strap, take the schools off, and then they'll turn the helmet in, they'll take their chin strap off and give us the helmet without a chin strap. So please help make sure we get chin straps turned back in, back in as part of the equipment. The only other thing I want to say is last year we had a good year. I think it was fun. I think everybody, the kids liked it. Just I want to ask one thing. What are we out there for, guys? What, what, what is your goal as a coach in this little league? Anybody thought about that? Let me ask you this. I played up here in the 80s. Marshall County, we've done what we're doing now. Do you all know who won the county championship in 1983? Huh? Little League County Championship in 1983. Do you all know? <laughs> no. No one does. Now, it's, I want to make all it's not positive, but I want the time to take, to say one thing. Now, I'm not mentioning no names. It does not matter. Everybody's de devoting their time, and we appreciate it. But last year, in today's society, you got to remember, people use these right here. And I got sent to me on two different coaches on audio, video, didn't show the coaches, saying, I'm not worried about it. I'm here to win a championship. I'm not worried about playing time. I'm here to win a championship. Guys, nobody knows who wins. Nobody knows who won the championship in 1983. No one's going to know who won champion, last year's championship 20 years from now. But five years from now, or seven, eight years from now, they're going to know if we don't have kids in this program. I understand as they get older, third and fourth, fifth and sixth, more playing time for the kids that are working harder and playing more. But everybody should have a role and play some. We got to keep kids interested in the program. It's a balance. That's what's tough and that's what's hard in Little League. But just like Coach Cleaver right there, the very last one said it should be fun. Well, if a kid's standing on the sideline the whole time, he's not having fun. Now, we all know there's some that they need to decide whether they want to play football or not. But that'll sort itself out. But you can find them a defined role in special teams, kickoffs, but everybody should play. All right? Let's have a good season this year. Okay, just to kind of conclude things, I think it just kind of puts everything back in perspective. And the one thing that, that I can share, I, I wasn't a graduate of this school, and I wasn't necessarily a person that played in this program, but I'm going on my 13th year. I had a chance to, uh, to coach with the previous three head coaches and got the job here. And, and one thing I want to always emphasize is, and, and this was a time when you know I was around Jim Shelton. Jim Shelton always said, whatever you do has to be for the best interest of the program. You know, when we look at this little league and what we're trying to do, we're trying to build this thing up from the ground up to where, you know, we can be successful for years to come.
okay? And uh, one of the things that, you know, Shane kind of mentioned was the, uh, the fact of having the four practice locations. What y'all think about this as coaches, all right? If we got, let's say, orange on one side, blue on another, gray, whatnot, you got first grade all the way up to sixth grade, okay? One of the things for practice planning this year, and this may help you guys out as coaches, okay, is you got, you know, all these grades in the same place where you're pre-practice or you're stretching or some of your drills that you do, Combine those three teams, you got older kids teaching young kids. You got older coaches that's been around three or four years teaching those younger coaches. You know, so those are some things we're looking at there, and then of course you can break off of that and work on what you need to for your games that weekend. All right, but at the end of the day, we're trying to build each other up, okay? Because every year, you know, you have these kids that come into, you know, first and second graders now in pads. All right, that's intimidating, okay? But we want to keep them playing. We want to be being able to play third and fourth grade. And then keep them playing at that next level, fifth and sixth. And then they get to Coach Buchanan in seventh grade, you know, educated and ready to go. And then in two years, they're in this locker room. Okay, so, you know, eight, ten years down the road, all right, it, it makes a big difference. And I'll tell you about uh, our experience. I took uh, Shane and Steve to uh, Allen County Scottsdale. There's a guy that I uh, played with in college. He'd been there 11 years. Okay, he did this when he came into uh, to his job his first year, year 11. His second graders that he started out with were his seniors. 4A school in a rural area had 90 kids on their rosters. Within the last five years, they played in the state championship game. You know, so that's a blueprint that I'd like to adopt, and it starts kind of with our little league, and we're all in it together, okay? And these guys that's in here got a love for the game or you wouldn't be in here, okay? And you got to think about this, too. You probably remember the first coach you had, too. You probably remember the first coach you had in little league that taught you to love the game. So take that, move it forward. I appreciate you guys. And like I said, if uh, some of the guys wasn't here this, uh, this evening, we'll have this film. They'll get their coaching certification. And still a few days, you know, still a little while until August. But uh, that gets football on the mind, okay? And then, the, you know, weeks to months to come, contact us. Coach Cleaver, Coach Morris, myself, Coach Johnson. He, he has to go to the track meet or he'd have hung around. He hated to leave, but he wanted to let you guys know he's there as a resource as well. And, you know, when I'm not around, there's going to be times he's around as well, too. Okay, he's, he's vested in the program. But thank you guys. If you guys got any questions, we'll uh, hang around. And then, like I said, got plenty of food as well.